as we gather in this sacred space to remember our beloved Paulette, let us center in body, mind, and spirit first by taking a deep breath together. We also center with these words by Thich Nhat Hanh, a great leader in the Buddhist faith, a tradition that inspired Paulette throughout much of her life. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become holy ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us all and to all living things. Evoking the presence of the great compassion, let us fill our hearts with our own compassion towards ourselves and towards all living beings. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be the cause of suffering to each other. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life, and with the sufferings that are going on around us, let us practice the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. Amen. Good afternoon. I am the Reverend Heather Janulis, and it's my great privilege to serve the Winchester Unitarian Society as the parish minister. On behalf of our entire congregation and Paulette's family, I welcome you to this celebration of her life. Whether you are attending here in our beautiful sanctuary or via the live stream, it is so good to be together. Those who are attending by the live stream may access the order of service on the front page of our website, winchesteruu.org. We especially want to acknowledge some people who had hoped to be here in person, the Virginia relatives. It appears the various airlines were conspiring against them, along with Mother Nature. So they are not here in person, and as a result, we will not hear from Doug Long. Thank you for trying to be here. Thank you all for your presence today. Those attending in person are invited to attend a reception outdoors at the Bell Tower Terrace. The immediate family will gather in the parlor for receiving line. After extending your greetings, follow the crowd out to the terrace to enjoy food, drink, conversation, and the sharing of memories. Before we continue our service, I ask that we take a moment to now turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. I now invite Jeannie Thomases and Barbara Magnuson to continue our service by lighting the chancel chalice. I'll start again. I'm sorry. Help us to be the always hopeful gardeners of the spirit who know that without darkness, nothing comes to birth, as without light, nothing flowers. Let us now rise in body and spirit to join in singing hymn 199 in the gray hymnal, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. This is a favorite hymn of the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., and a hymn that Paulette sung to her husband in his final moments.
our friend, our mother, grandmother and great-grandmother, our aunt, our great-aunt, Paulette, was born Paulette Long on June 23, 1922, in Richmond, Virginia. She was the second child born to Raymond Victor Long and Harriet Paulette Long. Harriet went by Hattie. And Paulette's older brother, whom Paulette idolized, was Raymond Jr. Raymond Sr. was an architect who in time became the Secretary of Education for Virginia. Hattie raised her daughter to be a good Southern lady. As a girl, Paulette had much less freedom than her brother. But Paulette's early years included what would become a lifelong passion, acting. She would stand on the living room coffee table before her mother and recite lines. This led to her first role of a museum mummy that comes to life in the play Theories and Thumbs. Throughout her life, Paulette never fell out of love with theater. Much later in life, her daughters remember her dressing from head to toe like a cat for her granddaughter's birthday party, much to her granddaughter's delight. As a state employee, Raymond Sr. was not wealthy, but the family still enjoyed special occasions, such as visiting a lake in Maryland during the summertime. Her mother's strong advocacy, referencing Raymond's public service, helped Paulette get accepted into St. Catherine's School for high school. Paulette worked hard, pursuing her academics along with a work-study job and accepting the role of Rosalind in All's Well That Ends Well. Paulette graduated from high school in 1940. Paulette then enrolled in Sweetbriar College where she majored in drama. One of her best roles was that of Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing. Paulette was also active in their music program. There are a couple stories about how Paulette met a young man named Ganson Taggart at Sweetbriar. Ganson was in Virginia participating in training as a naval enlistee. A mutual friend said to Ganson, thinking of Paulette, I met the woman you should marry. <laughs> the two did meet. Paulette was sitting on the lawn of Sweetbriar with her hair in curlers. <laughs> it took some persuading on Ganson's part, but he eventually won Paulette over, and they became sweethearts. In retrospect, their friend's encouragement to marry made sense, as they had a lot in common. Both Paulette and Ganson came from modest means, and found themselves traveling in wealthy circles. They shared a number of values, investment in lifelong learning, welcoming people regardless of money or social status, advocacy for the marginalized, and belief in the education of women. The young couple also prized honesty and commitment to family. Paulette graduated from Sweetbriar in 1944, sadly the same year that her mother died. The next year, she and Ganson wed in R Richmond. In this time of great transition, the newlyweds moved to San Diego by train as Ganson was assigned to a naval base. The United States was still engaged in World War II. With the conclusion of the war, Ganson pursued work as a chemical engineer, bringing the young couple first to Tennessee, then to Oklahoma, Boston, Brownsville, Texas, and then back to Boston. While in Tulsa, they joined a Unitarian church, the faith of Ganson's family. It was in Boston that they welcomed their first child, T, in 1948. Daughter Paulette was born in 1949, and Corey arrived in 1950. The children were all very young when the family settled here in Winchester. An important place for Paulette was this congregation, the Winchester Unitarian Society. Like Paulette, the minister at the time, Bob Storer was enthusiastic about theater. He recognized Paulette's talent and encouraged her, casting her in family portrait. Paulette was also influential in bringing innovation to worship, helping to organize a liturgical dance troupe. Paulette's daughters remember her as an attentive mother, a parent who did not play favorites, but observed their individual interests and nurtured them. She was also an active parent, participating in skiing, tennis, and ice skating. Paulette brought a sense of spirituality into her homemaking, rendering the house at 17 Ridgefield Road a true sanctuary for the family. Daughter Corey describes her mother this way. 
She fulfilled the roles as a mother, wife, and running the household while carving out ways to use her theatrical interests and contribute to the community by leading creative dramatics groups and directing plays at my elementary school, volunteering at the hospital, organizing neighborhood caroling groups, and participating in the life of this church. In 1965, the family moved to the Netherlands as Ganson received a significant promotion. This change put Paulette into the role of the wife of a company executive, organizing parties and social events for his colleagues. While she, when she wasn't getting to know her Dutch neighbors, Paulette directed a number of high school plays and became president of the American Women's Club. The Women's Club provided informal mental health support for its member families, motivating Paulette to serve as a de facto social worker on their behalf. It was around this time that Ganson and Paulette began to explore Eastern practices such as yoga and meditation in earnest. Corey remembers their return to Winchester in 1970. She writes, Mom faced big changes in the United States and in her life, such as three girls having left home for college. Mom began moving forward in her career, first with graduate school at Emerson College, and then with the help of her mentor, Safira Linden, building her Winchester drama workshop, doing creative dramatics with middle schoolers, and then becoming a yoga teacher and starting a yoga class at the newly opened Jenks Center, which she taught for many years until her mid-80s. The return to the States was also the time when the family purchased a cottage in Gloucester, the Cape Sewell. The cottage became the center for many family gatherings and a beloved tradition of Fourth of July gatherings for the congregation's worship committee. Ganson then began his own consulting business, which allowed them greater flexibility. Paulette and Ganson traveled frequently to San Francisco and Eugene, Oregon, and to Florida and Virginia. This was also the time that Paulette became interested in Sufism, inspiring her to later identify spiritually as a Sufitarian. <laughs> Ganson and Paulette became grandparents with the birth of Lincoln in 1981 and Kendall in 1986. They had the good fortune of spending an afternoon every week together for both companionship and music lessons. Paulette has always been close with her extended family, having ongoing connections with her nieces, Carter and Lucy, her nephew Doug, their spouses, children and grandchildren, and Paulette's great-grandchildren. Paulette continued spiritual and artistic exploration choosing experimental teaching techniques with theater and yoga, and studying Reiki, acupuncture, Pilates, Feldenkrais, and meditation. She founded the yoga class here at WUS in 2006, and the class continues to this day. As Ganson and Paulette aged, they faced the natural rites of passage, elders' experience. In 1992, they downsized and moved to the ledges, the condominium community, in 2006, Ganson suffered a health crisis, inspiring them to move to Carlton Willard Retirement Community. Sadly, Ganson died in 2007. One way Paulette coped with this great loss was through staying engaged with the activities and communities that had always sustained her. Through the Carlton Willard players, she reprised the role of Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing from her college days. Good fortune allowed her to spend time singing with a college friend, also at Carlton Willard. When I arrived here in 2015, Paulette welcomed me to her congregation, once hosting me for a festive lunch at Carlton Willard. It was a joy getting to know her. I also enjoyed spending time with Paulette during what we would call her salons. It was helpful to set up a small table there in the back of the sanctuary, away from all the conversation at coffee hour, so Paulette and her friends could easily hear one another and have a place to set their coffee cups. Paulette would come to worship as often as she could. Like many, I appreciated Paulette for how she adapted to medical challenges in the twilight of her life. At age 89, Paulette made the brave choice to undergo open heart surgery. Over time, her healthcare needs required her to shift from independent living to assisted living and then from assisted living to nursing care. While her memory faded at the very end of her life, she seemed content and blessedly still connected
for her closest family members. Paulette Long Taggart died peacefully on January 12th of this year, a little shy of her 100th birthday. With such a long life and with so many loved ones, there is so much more to say about Paulette. I now invite us into a time of silence so we may each welcome our own memories of time with Paulette into the sacred space. Out of the silence, we will remain seated and sing There is a Love, a hymn drawn from a prayer that gave Paulette great comfort. The words to this hymn can be found in your order of service. Let us now enter into the silence together. Well, I want to give you all a very, very warm welcome uh, and really thank you for being with us here today and your steadfast warmth and embrace of our mom, Paulette, and of all of us. These COVID years have clearly been isolating and difficult for us all. Many times, one of the few family members who were able to visit with mom, I would think to myself, after all this time so isolated, I wonder who will remember Mom. <laughs> but looking at you all here today, I couldn't imagine the extent to which you've rallied and made every effort to join with us here in the sanctuary and online. Thank you. It is often said that apples don't fall very far from their trees, and yes, Mom was almost as headstrong as I was, some would say, still am. I, as her first child and eldest daughter, fairly early on, Mom having been raised a young lady in debutante, as Reverend Heather reported, 
In Richmond, Virginia, tried to raise me, her tomboy daughter, in similar ladylike ways. This presented great difficulties. But mom, always up to a challenge, quickly figured out that instead of my teaching myself acrobatics on the living room furniture, that I should be enrolled in one of the few physical activities acceptable for young girls in the 1950s, ballet school. <laughs> and she tirelessly took me to classes, rehearsals, and performances at arts museums, downtown Boston theaters, and more. While mom never imagined that her daughters would grow up to be working professionals, supporting themselves without needing financial support from their significant others or spouses, she deeply understood that her daughters would benefit from having a strong, well-developed set of interests and skills of their own, and she worked hard throughout her parenting years to foster our extracurricular interests and expand our education and experiences. And as Reverend Heather said, she continued to do this with her grandchildren, my son Lincoln and daughter Kendall. Among my favorite stories about mom in later years is one from a visit she made to my office in downtown Boston at an investment firm where I had been working for a few years, and this was mom's first visit. One of my colleagues politely asked mom what she was engaged in, and mom immediately responded that, among other things, she taught yoga and meditation at the senior center in Winchester. Given that mom at this time was well into her 70s, my colleague was somewhat stunned, <laughs> and afterwards came into my office and said to me, T, your mother teaches yoga to the seniors how old are the seniors? <laughs> In her later years, those who didn't know her would continue to underestimate mom. A few years ago, after she had been rushed to the hospital from emergen in an emergency ambulance from Carlton Willard, she was very ill and her diagnosis and treatment had yet to be determined. I was visiting with her at her bedside when a young physician came by to check on her. And he said to me, she seems to be suffering from dementia. She was talking earlier about some of her acting roles in Shakespearean plays. <laughs> I looked at him and said, she has been acting in Shakespearean plays, including playing the role of Beatrice in a recent skit performed based on Much Ado About Nothing. He looked at me shocked <laughs> and said, yes, that's what she was telling us. <laughs> and I replied, she loves theater, and it would seem she's reminiscing, not delirious, to which he clearly agreed. In more recent years, COVID has resulted in us all becoming more socially isolated. And while it hasn't been easy for any of us, it was especially difficult for those like mom who were resident in retirement communities where COVID precautions included quarantining alone in your room with personal contact only with your caretakers and family visits initially only virtually via FaceTime or Zoom. This meant no dining room and eating meals brought in on a tray by yourself for months. Mom was intrepid, as were her staff assigned nurses, and I need to give a special thank you shout out to the Caswell nursing staff and others from Carlton Willard who are here with us today online, and a mother and daughter team, Florence and Lisa, her private nurse aides, who agreed to cut back on their hours, only coming to care for mom and to provide not only companionship, but personal care during the hours that they were there. For months, these caretakers were the only people that mom saw in person. Finally, when we and family members were allowed to visit for months until we were all fully vaccinated, we had to don full PPE provided at the reception desk after a full screening and affidavits about our health. And if you have ever tried to encase yourself in PPE, 
you will understand how almost totally unrecognizable you are. Taking selfies of myself and sending them to close friends, they would ask, who's this? <laughs> Not mom. When I would enter her room, fully garbed in PPE, she would take one look and say, hi, T. Great costume. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? And thank you for coming. Most of all, we are grateful that notwithstanding these years of COVID disconnection, that you all remembered mom, even though you often could not visit or spend time with her. Your notes, wonderful cards, and more meant the world to her and to us. We will all miss mom, her warm greetings, keen interest in hosting her family and friends. She loved life and all that we brought into her life. And as often been said, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years. And we might all agree that mom had a lot of both. So a little more. Um, Dad led the way on all the ski trips, but Mom led the way, in, led us all in song on the way on the drives home. She would lead us through some variation of our family repertoire as we got from the ski slopes back to our house. Mom was really the heart of the family. She was definitely the more emotional one. And I'd have to say that all through our lives, she was really there to support us, both, both as kids and as adults. As we all know, Mom was an actress, and she enjoyed taking the stage, both in the theater and in real life. As been mentioned, um, in, in the theater, she played many roles, from the crazy Opal and Everybody Loves Opal, who hung her tea bags out on the clothesline so they could get reused until they were <laughs> fully used. Um, to Annie Mame, the progressive and flamboyant woman who lived life to the fullest, to the many Shakespearean roles play, played you know, from her youth to into her 90s. But in life, the actress in her could be more than a little embarrassing for her daughters, especially this one. Um, there was a restaurant we used to go to in The Hague where mom and the piano player developed a little bit of a competition to see if he could play a song that she couldn't sing. Um, and I was quite literally under the table with embarrassment. <laughs> but I don't think he ever played a song she couldn't sing. Many years later, mom took up the mic and sang, try to remember, at my 50th birthday party. By then, I was, of course, very proud of her. Um, and it really touched my heart. And afterwards, I, have friends, I had friends come over asking me if they could rent my mom. <laughs> She was raised in Virginia and moved to New England, both somewhat traditional conservative places. So our move to the Netherlands was really transformative, not because it isn't conservative, but just because it was a very different kind of place for them and for all of us. And, and as was mentioned, this, at, during this period, she started yoga and meditation and began exploring other religions. Um, and by the time mom and dad had returned to the States, their minds and hearts had really expanded, I think not rejecting their past, but adding new dimensions to their lives, new interests. Mother-daughter relationships can be complicated, and ours certainly was too. She was a strong force, and I was a very different person. There was a lot of love between us, but I think it took us, but there was some friction, I think, and took us some time before we arrived at an easier place of being together. Of course, it may have been complicated by the fact that I share her name. Paulette Long Tacker, the whole thing. <laughs> um, so for many years, mom and dad came out to visit my husband Bill and myself in San Francisco. And every year we'd um, take a trip down to um, Tassajaro, which is a Zen monastery in the winter and in the summer it um, includes guests. And it's a long drive there, over last 14 miles over dirt road over a mountain. You get there, there's no electricity and no internet, so it's a wonderful retreat. 
And there we enjoyed hiking and reading and sketching and taking in the sulfur baths and the good vegetarian food. It was a really special place to share. And then Mama always wore this hat to Tassahara. And I think you know, all who knew her will remember that wherever she went, including Tassahara, she brought a little bit of a sense of style. I feel much gratitude for the family and the mother that I had. There's an empty space now that I'm the only Paulette, but mom lives on in my heart. Her death means, means the end of her life, but clearly not the end of our relationship. She cared deeply about many things, especially about people, and I do believe she left the world a better place for having been here. Good afternoon. Mom Haiku. Elegance, grace, style, heart attuned, embracing life, warm and glowing smile. At one point in a Mr. Rogers documentary, he looked directly into the camera to ask, is there someone in your life who loved you into existence, who loved you so much that you were able to become who you are right now? Yes, Mr. Rogers, there was, and my mother. And I'm very grateful to be gathered here uh, to celebrate her life with all of you today in her very own church home. I'm grateful to each of you for being here, and I'm grateful to those of you who tried to get here who couldn't make it because of the weather, and um, to all of you who supported her during her final and more difficult years. I'm also grateful to my sisters for the loving support and smooth collaboration in all we've dealt with since our mother's passing. Born right after the summer solstice 100 years ago, Mom lived with passion, determination, and direction. Dignified and warm, she radiated compassion, purpose, and love. I felt her love my whole life and learned as a child that I could rely on that love when I needed her. Mom excelled at tuning in emotionally and was able to talk sensitively about difficult and distressing things. This included teaching me about compassion and modeling it by giving a kind word, hug, or whatever she could to those who needed it. When unsure about how to approach a hurting friend, resolve a conflict, or write a condolence note, I found that mom could help me figure out what I wanted to say. And when I was hurting, her uplifting words were a healing balm applied by her caring voice. Mom expressed her passion for life and joie de vivre in various ways, infusing any occasion with her warmth, stylish presentation, emotional openness, enthusiasm, and caring presence. Mom's whole adult life involved, oops, sorry, skip scum going back, whether the occasion was singing on a family road trip, taking us to a cultural event, elegant entertaining, taking in nature's beauty on a hike, or performing in a wide range of roles from Shakespeare's Beatrice, as you've heard, in Much Ado About Nothing, to being one of nine naughty nurses dancing the can-can at the annual hospital benefit, the Winton Club. Mom lived it fully and brought her whole self to the experience. Mom's whole adult life involved continual adapting, but the last 20 years brought even more adjustment and loss. Somehow mom adapted, doing so with courage, humor, and renewed determination. I so admire how she found ways to cope and continued to find joy and quality of life 
whatever her circumstances. When mom's gradual health decline accelerated in December 21, I flew east to be with her. I arrived to find her energy was waning and her eyes remained closed. At one point, as I sat by her bedside telling her how much I loved her, she somehow mustered the strength to hoarsely whisper, thank you. Only it was more like, thank you. Those were the last words I would ever hear her speak. Mom died two weeks later, right after the last of us daughters had arrived. She moved out of this life the way she had lived it, with grace, gratitude, and full of love. Hi everyone, for those who don't know me, I'm Lincoln, Paulette's grandson. Um, uh, due in no small part to my grandparents' inspired example, I began meditating some years ago, and I think we've talked a little bit about that already. Um, within the Buddhist tradition, 
There's a meditation practice called metta, often translated in the Pali as loving kindness. This type of meditation generally begins with an effort to conjure a sense of receiving love and benevolence. I'm perhaps a little bit more concrete, and for a long time this concept was mostly in a uh, mostly inaccessible abstraction. But at a retreat I attended a few years ago, an insightful and kind of gritty meditation instructor taught this concept as, quote, the uncomplicated, non-judgmental, you are special well beyond maybe what you even deserve kind of love. To drive the point home, he said, think of it as grandmother love. And of course, Nana became immediately into focus, something that had felt uh, a little too esoteric and abstract for my way of thinking became a deep felt experience as I thought of her archetypal example. If you all indulge me, indulge me in a very short variation on this practice uh, that I hope will resonate with you and evoke, with, uh, evoke her today. If you can, close your eyes, bring Paulette to mind as if she were seated right next to you, smiling at you, Imagine her truly wishing you to be happy, fulfilled, for you to have a life that is flourishing. Imagine her beaming this towards you with her smile in her eyes. And with your next breath, inhale and draw in that intention of goodness. To me, this is my Nana distilled. She was a huge presence in my life. And I'm so grateful to keep some piece of her with me as I'm reminded of her love in this way. Hi. Um, for those of you who haven't met, I'm Kendall, and this is Paulette's great-granddaughter, Mira. From my earliest memories, my Nana was a fierce supporter of nearly everything I did. Each Thursday, she would dutifully help me get to piano lessons. Oh, you want that copy? Okay, I brought two. She would dutifully help me get to piano lessons and insist that the sounds I banged out were exceptionally beautiful despite significant evidence to the contrary. But her support didn't, oh, you're going this way? Do you wanna, here, wanna go to your place? Yeah. Okay. Um, exceptionally beautiful, despite significant evidence to the contrary. But her support didn't always take the form of praise. She'd be one of the first people to raise her eyebrows at a boyfriend of mine she was skeptical of, or to not so subtly question a haircut, asking me, what did you do to your head? <laughs> I feel very lucky to have had her in my life this long, through childhood and adolescence and now having my own daughter. During each of those stages, she gave me the gift of knowing I would always be loved, despite many missteps along the way. She also taught me the power of having someone in my corner who believed I would always find my way back. She also taught me about aging, how to accept that you might, with time you might need to nap more, how to savor tiny glasses of wine when your doctor has advised you to give it up, how to take comfort in the pleasures of a room full of familiar voices, even when your hearing loss makes it hard to follow the details of the conversation. My Nana looked, showed me what it looked like to face those challenges with grace. I'm immensely grateful to the caregivers who supported Nana in that process, particularly through COVID in the last several months of her life. So here's to Nana, lover of caramels, master of the orange pantsuit, queen of the epic table setting, yogi before it was cool, and grandmother of the highest order. I love you, I will miss you, and I will teach my daughter Mira all about you.
I invite us into the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, spirit of many names, and no name to embrace your power. We give thanks for Paulette Long Taggart and her inner light, the light that shone through her love of the arts, her warmth not just in her compassion and love for others, but in her courageous curiosity about the nature of the wider world and the nature of the spirit beyond our immediate understanding. We give thanks for her grace, her personality, her will, her love, her generosity, her presence, and her incredible self. This day that we gather to honor her memory and name her legacy, may she serve as an example for how we may shine our light in the time that remains for us. May we who are gathered find strength in one another when we miss her presence the most. And may we know that she is present with every beautiful piece of music, every beautiful, graceful movement of a dancer, every hug within the family, every time we gather in quiet, loving kindness. We ask this in the name of all that is holy. Amen. I invite us to now rise in body and spirit to join in singing our closing hymn, We Laugh, We Cry, verses 1, 3, and 4. We will not sing verse number 2.
We close our time together with these words. Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it is a tree which stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. Hold on to my hand, even when I have gone away from you. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.